The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. We also saw, or we tried to understand what the free energy actually was. And we said that when you have, for example, an exothermic reaction, that not all of that energy released is going to be released in a form that can do useful work. Some of that energy that's released, some of that delta H, for example, goes into or can go into the vibrations and rotations of the product molecules which that energy of which is not able to do useful work. And so the amount of energy that we can actually use to do work is this free energy, is delta G right here. So it's something, it can be something less than delta H. We also saw a condition, which was the oxidation of glucose, where delta G was actually greater than delta H. And that's the case where we have some of that internal energy locked up in the reactants, which now is released in the form of this useful work delta G. And I think we had just started to talk about this term delta S, which is the change in the entropy for the reaction. And we talked about how to calculate it. We calculate it from the absolute entropies of the reactants and the products. So delta S for a reaction, then, is the absolute entropy of each one of the product times the appropriate stoichiometric number summed over all the products, and then minus the absolute entropy of each one of the reactants times that appropriate stoichiometric number summed over all the reactants. And it's the difference between the two is delta S for the chemical reaction. And S is an absolute entropy that is a result of the third law of thermodynamics, which uh, I mentioned, I think, last time. You will talk about it a lot in detail in 560. All right. But uh, let's look at an example here of the change in entropy. Because I want to show you that you can have a change in entropy that's large enough to make an endothermic reaction spontaneous. You can have what we call an entropy-driven reaction. For example, the melting of ice. To melt ice, to go from the solid form of water to the liquid form, well, that is an endothermic reaction, 6.95 kilojoules per mole. However, going from the solid form of water to the liquid form, there's a great increase there in the entropy, in the disorder. And it's that increase in the disorder that allows that reaction to be spontaneous. So we can calculate the entropy change for that reaction. That entropy change then is the absolute entropy of the product, which is liquid water minus the absolute entropy of the reactant, which is solid water. And you can see that delta S here is positive. We increased, is there a question that I can help you out with? D did you have a question? Can I help you out? OK. Um, that delta S here is positive. We've increased the disorder of the system. And it is that positive delta S, then, that gives us a delta G that's negative, meaning our reaction in this direction from solid to the liquid is a spontaneous reaction. So delta G here is delta H, 6.95, times or minus the temperature at which the reaction is proceeding times that change in the entropy. And in this case here, delta G now is minus 1.57 kilojoules that reaction is spontaneous, even though it is endothermic. And it's that increase in the entropy that is driving this reaction here. All right, now I want you also to notice something right here. And that is that the change in the entropy 
usually is in units of joules per degree Kelvin mole. Delta H just about always is in units of kilojoules per uh, mole. So remember, when you're working with delta H, bells ought to go off in your head. Eh, 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 eh. You know, remember that you probably have to do a unit conversion here from joules to kilojoules. All right, this catches a lot of students on an exam, so I'm trying to give you some fear warning about this. All right? Okay. Now, um, what I want to talk about is this uh, free energy of formation, delta G sub F naught. The Gibbs free energy of formation is analogous to the enthalpy of formation. This is what we looked at the last time. Right? The Gibbs free energy of formation, delta G sub F, are not for our standard state, which is one bar pressure. The Gibbs free energy of formation is the free energy formation of one mole of a compound from the elements, from its elements, in their most stable form at the uh, standard state. All right? So it's analogous to the heat of formation, only it's the free energy of formation. It is tabulated for you just like the enthalpy of formation is. So you can look up the free energy of formation for uh, every compound that is, is known. However, unlike the enthalpy of formation here, the free energy of formation, you can also calculate. You can calculate from this expression, right? Delta G equal delta H minus T delta S. So if you've got a reaction for which you, um, you've defined the free energy of formation, so if you know the free energy of formation of a molecule, and you know the delta S for the reaction that defines that uh, uh, enthalpy of formation, then you can calculate the free energy of formation for every molecule, all right? Which is different from the enthalpy of formation. That you do have to look up. But you can actually calculate the free energy of formation given that you know the enthalpy of formation and given that you know delta S for the reaction that defines that en uh, enthalpy of formation. All right? Questions on that? Okay. But why is this uh, free energy of formation so important? Well, that's what we've got to look at right now. Here's a reaction. Uh, that produces one mole of uh, carbon dioxide. The delta G for this reaction is minus 394 kilojoules per mole. The delta G for this reaction is defined as the free energy of formation for CO2. Why? Because this reac reaction, as written, produces one mole of CO2 from the elements that compose CO2, but the elements in their most stable form. The elements are carbon, and the most stable form of carbon is graphite, and the element is oxygen, and O2 is the most stable form of oxygen at one bar pressure and uh, our room temperature, which we're working with here. All right, so that's the free energy of formation of CO2. And, um, this is very important because that free energy of formation of a molecule defines the molecule's stability relative to decomposition to its elements. So for example here, the forward direction here, this delta G is negative. It's spontaneous in the forward direction. When delta G is negative, delta G of formation is negative for a molecule, what we say is that that molecule is thermodynamically stable relative to its elements, right? Because the formation of that molecule, that delta G is negative. The reaction is spontaneous as written in the forward direction. It is not spontaneous in the reverse direction, right? The reverse direction 
this delta G would be positive. So because the delta G for this reaction is negative, we say that CO2 is thermodynamically stable relative to decomposition to its elements, carbon and oxygen. So this is important. The sign of the free energy of formation for a molecule is important. Had the free energy of formation of CO2 been positive, we would have said that was thermodynamically unstable relative to decomposition to its elements. Because this forward reaction, delta G would have been positive, but the reverse reaction would have been negative. The reverse reaction, there would be a spontaneous tendency for CO2 to decompose. All right. All right, but this is an example, CO2, where CO2 is stable relative to decomposition to its elements. Here's an example of a molecule uh, where uh, it is thermodynamically unstable relative to decomposition to its elements. Benzene, right? I write a reaction here that is the formation of one mole of benzene from the elements in the most stable form. The free energy of formation of a mole of benzene here is positive, 124 kilojoules per mole. It's positive. What does that mean? Well, it means that the reverse reaction, delta G, is negative. It means that benzene has a thermodynamic tendency to decompose into its elements, right? It's unstable relative to decomposition into its elements. Because it has a positive delta G, it's the reverse reaction that's spontaneous. All right, but even though a reverse reaction may be spontaneous, it can also be really pretty slow, right? When was the last time you saw a pint of benzene decompose to graphite and hydrogen? Not recently, right? And so even though you have a thermodynamic tendency to decompose, right, it doesn't mean that the rate is going to be fast enough for you to see that in any reasonable amount of time. So there's a thermodynamic effect and there's a kinetic effect. And you're going to talk about the kinetic effect in much more detail with Professor Drennan a few weeks from now. But at the moment right here, we've got two different names to talk about thermodynamic stability and kinetic stability, so to speak. And that is the following. We call a molecule stable or unstable. And when we use those terms, stable or unstable, we're referring to the delta G of formation. We're referring to the thermodynamic tendency of the molecule to decompose. So benzene here is thermodynamically unstable with respect to decomposition to its elements. However, benzene is what we call non-labile. These terms, labile and non-labile, refer to the rate with which that thermodynamic tendency is realized. So benzene because the rate of decomposition is so slow, such that you never see it, we say benzene is non-labile, all right? Non-labile means it's not going to decompose, not because it doesn't have the thermodynamic tendency to, but because the rate is just too slow, all right? However, if benzene's rate for decomposition was very fast, we call it a labile molecule, but it's not. It's non-labile, but it is unstable. So unstable refers to the thermodynamic tendency. Labile, non-labile refers to the kinetic, the rates at which that thermodynamic tendency is realized. OK? OK. So. Well, like the free, the enthalpy of formation, delta H sub F, like that, delta G sub F, the free energy of formation, well, that can also be zero, right? 
So for example, for the elements hydrogen, oxygen, chlorine, xenon, all those gases, free energy of formation is zero. All right, just the same way in which we described it last time for the enthalpy of formation. For the elements uh, bromine here and mercury in the liquid form, hey, delta G sub F, free energy of formation is equal to zero. For the elements carbon in the form of graphite, sodium, iron, iodine, all solids, their free energy of formation is also equal to zero because those are the elements in their most stable form at our standard state. However, look at this. The free energy of formation of bromine in the gas phase, hey, that's not equal to zero. It's not equal to zero because bromine in the gas phase is not the most stable form of bromine at our standard state. Liquid bromine is. So, it's, so delta G of formation of bromine in the gas phase is not zero. Likewise here, the free energy of formation of diamond, hey, that's not zero because diamond is not the most stable form of the element carbon at one bar pressure and room temperature. Graphite is, okay? So you do have to look at the, it's important to look at the form, the phase of the elements that you're dealing with. Okay, if you wanna calculate delta G for a reaction, well just like calculating delta H for the reaction, you can use the free energy of formation. You need to know the free energy of formation for every one of the products. Multiply that by the appropriate stoichiometric number. Sum that all up. Right? And then you do the same here for the reactants. You need to know the free energy of formation for every single one of the reactants. Multiplied by the stoichiometric number sum that all up and take the difference and you will have the free energy of the free energy for that chemical reaction okay notice this is products minus reactants right. just like calculating enthalpies from the heats of formation that was products minus reactants However, when we calculated enthalpies from bond enthalpies, that was reactants minus products. All right, that's something you do have to know. Likewise, you can also calculate delta G for a reaction now from knowing delta H for that reaction and also knowing delta S for that reaction. So you got your choice to use the free energies of formation that you can look up, or from knowing the enthalpy for a reaction and knowing the entropy for that reaction, you can calculate delta G, all right? So you got your choice with delta G here, depending on what information you're given or no. Okay, so now what we want to talk about is uh, our ability or inability to control the spontaneity of some uh, chemical reaction, to control it by virtue of adjusting the temperature. All right, All right so let's take uh, this example here. This is a sodium bicarbonate, better known as baking soda. This is uh, what you put into the dough of uh, some kind of baked goods that you want to make, muffins or cakes. You put it in there in order to lighten the batter. And of course, the way this works is that the sodium bicarbonate decomposes. It decomposes to form CO2 and water. And um, when it decomposes, it does so at, um, in the oven, and the CO2 and the water then expand, right? They evaporate, but they, in that dough, they kind of make bubbles, right? Before they totally evaporate, and around 
those gas bubbles, the dough kind of hardens a little bit. And um, eventually the CO2 and water are driven off. But what it leaves behind is a very porous structure in the, in the dough. So uh, it leaves you something that you can actually put your teeth into. Have you ever tried putting your teeth into some cake where somebody left out the sodium bicarbonate? It's an interesting experience. I've done it. <laughs> OK, so important here. But this is a reaction that is very endothermic, plus 136 kilojoules per mole. It is, however, a reaction where there's an increase in the entropy. Right? We're increasing the entropy a lot here, increasing the disorder. And let's calculate delta G for this reaction. Well, delta G for this reaction at room temperature is plus 36 kilojoules per mole. It is non-spontaneous. You know what? That's good, because you don't want that reaction to start when the dough batter is still sitting on the kitchen counter, right? Because at that point, you're not going to be able to harden the dough in any way. And, but let's try to make this reaction now spontaneous by increasing the temperature. Let's make this term here negative. More in absolute value, we want to make this term larger than delta H so that we can have a negative delta G. Well, we can do that by raising the temperature to a baking temperature, 350 Fahrenheit, which is about 450 degrees Kelvin. And now when we calculate delta G at 450 degrees Kelvin, what we find is that delta G is now negative. And now we've got a spontaneous reaction. Now when you get up to this baking temperature, this reaction proceeds readily in the forward direction. We have adjusted the spontaneity of this particular reaction by increasing the temperature. By making this term, this second term, the T times delta S, by making that larger in absolute magnitude than delta H, we've made that reaction spontaneous. So there are reactions for which we can control the spontaneity by adjusting the temperature. And let's take a look at that. Well, as you know here, delta G is a linear function of the temperature. So let me draw just a, a dependence. And actually, this is for the decomposition of sodium bicarbonate. Let me just draw delta G as a function of the temperature. The slope of this line here, the slope of that line is minus delta S for that reaction. Right? You can see that. This is going to be the slope. I'm plotting it versus T. The intercept is delta H. It's the enthalpy change for this reaction. And now let me just draw a zero here, dotted line. All right? I drew that zero because I want you to see that at some temperature right here that I'm going to label T star, at some temperature, that delta G is equal to zero. What that means is that at this temperature, the sign of delta G is changing. You can see that for temperatures less than T star, the value of delta G naught here is greater than zero, meaning the reaction is non-spontaneous. For temperatures greater than T star, right in here, you see that delta G naught is less than zero, means we have a spontaneous reaction. Right? We've controlled the spontaneity of this reaction by the use of temperature. Let's calculate the value of the temperature at which the spontaneity of this reaction changes. Let's do that. All right, to do that, we're going to set delta G naught here equal to zero. And then we're just going to solve for T star. 
We're going to solve for that value of T star, that for this delta H and that delta S will make delta G naught equal to zero. Let's do that. Well, then T star is delta H over delta S. If I plug in for the decomposition of sodium bicarbonate, the delta H and the delta S, then T star is 406 degrees Kelvin. All right? So your sodium bicarbonate isn't going to decompose until you get to this temperature, All right? Okay. So at least for this reaction, it appears we can control the spontaneity of this chemical reaction. And that is the case. In general, if you have a reaction that is endothermic, that is delta H is greater than zero, and if that reaction increases in entropy, delta S is greater than zero, you can, that reaction will be spontaneous for temperatures greater than some temperature T star. You can see that by the signs of the reactions here. If delta H up here is positive and delta S is positive, then you've got to increase this second term, T delta S, the absolute magnitude of it, enough so that it is larger than delta H and you're subtracting the two. Well, that's when you're going to get the delta G negative. All right. For large enough temperatures, the delta G will be negative. OK, but suppose we have a reaction that's exothermic. Delta H is less than 0. And a reaction that decreases the entropy, delta S, is less than 0. I plotted that now as a function of the temperature. And you can see that the slope of this line has changed. We now have this positive slope. All right, well, in this particular case, you're going to have a spontaneous reaction whenever the temperature is less than some temperature T star, right? Because right here, that's our T star. And so for temperatures less than that, delta G is negative. For temperatures greater than that, delta G is positive. All right? And again, you can see that. If delta H is less than 0, this delta H will be negative. And delta S here is going to be a negative. We're going to have a negative times a negative. That's a positive. And so since delta H is negative, T is going to have to be small. This is going to be a positive term. T is going to have to be small so that an absolute value, right, it is not larger than delta H in order to get a negative delta G. OK. However, suppose we have a reaction that's N exothermic, delta H less than 0, and delta S is greater than 0. We're increasing the entropy here. Well, this is the best of all worlds. When, dealt, when you have an exothermic reaction that increases the entropy, hey, this reaction is spontaneous at all temperatures. Delta G is going to be zero, uh, negative for all temperatures because delta H is negative. And then you have minus T delta S. Well, delta S is positive, so you have a negative number plus a negative number or a negative number minus a positive number. Delta G is always negative. Spontaneous at every temperature. For those reactions, you can't control the spontaneity of the reaction. And then finally, you can have a situation where you have an endothermic reaction, delta H greater than 0. And the worst of all cases, delta S less than 0. You're decreasing the entropy. You're making the system more ordered. In that case, you have a reaction that's never spontaneous. Again, you can see it from the sign. If delta H is positive and delta S here is negative, a negative times a negative is a positive. So we have a positive number plus a positive number. Hey, delta G is positive at all temperatures. OK? So with temperature there, we also can't adjust the spontaneity. OK. So this is uh, a very important here to uh, understand. 
All right. So now, what we've been talking about so far is uh, delta G's that uh, have been delta G naughts. We've been talking about delta G's, free energies of formation, in our standard state of one bar pressure. What that means for delta G naught, what that means is that the partial pressures of your reactants and your products, they are all one bar. So delta G naught for a reaction is the free energy change for that reaction when there's one atmosphere of each of, or one bar of each of the products and the reactants. So let's take this famous reaction. Argon plus boron going to carbon plus deuterium, all right? A plus B, C to D, all right? This delta G naught here, that's a delta G for a reaction under the conditions of one bar partial pressure for D, one bar partial pressure for C, one bar partial pressure for B, one bar partial pressure for A. That's what that means. But you know what? Gee, that's not the situation you usually have. Say, for example, you're going to start this reaction. You start the reaction with one bar of A and one bar of B. But, of course, you don't have any C or D yet, right? Because you haven't run the reaction. So what we've got to be able to do is to calculate delta G for conditions which aren't at the standard state, which aren't at one bar D, one bar C, one bar B, one bar A, all right? We've got to be able to do that. And the way you do that is represented here by this expression. Where this expression came from is, again, a subject of a great uh, interest in 560. You'll see where this expression comes from when you take 560. But right now, we're going to use it. This is going to allow us to calculate delta G from knowing the standard state delta G naught. It's going to allow us to calculate delta G for the reactants and products at any given pressure. All right? Okay, so you see this is delta G, delta G equal delta G naught plus RT ln of the following. This has the partial pressure of product C divided by a reference pressure raised to the appropriate stoichiometric number. And that's multiplied by the partial pressure of the product D divided by a reference pressure raised to the appropriate stoichiometric number. And that's all over the partial pressure of A divided by a reference pressure raised to that appropriate stoichiometric number times the partial pressure of the other reactant over some reference pressure raised to the uh, appropriate stoichiometric number. That ratio is something that we call a reaction quotient. We call it Q. It is the ratio of instantaneous partial pressures. So we might be running a reaction, and uh, at any time, the reaction may not be complete, at any time we can stop the reaction, we can figure out or measure what the partial pressures of reactants and products are, and we can calculate what this Q is. Right? Knowing what those are from a measurement. That's what the reaction quotient is. Now, our reference pressure is going to be one bar. So what I'm going to do, and what you can do in this reaction quotient, is that I'm going to put PRF, the reference pressure, as ones in here. Right? And so I'm not going to explicitly write it out. And that's just fine as long as you put the pressures then here 
in units of bar. Okay? So this is the reaction quotient. The form of it that we're going to use as long as you put the pressures here in units of bar. Okay. So we got to remember this because I'm now going to use this in a very interesting way. This is going to give me delta G at any arbitrary pressures of the reactants and the products. Okay? All right. So how am I going to use this? I'm going to start to talk about the equilibrium constant for the reaction. So I've got my famous A plus B going to C plus D reaction. And <clears throat> you already know that all reactions have some kind of equilibrium. There's a forward reaction and there's a reverse reaction. And we know that, as we said, delta G is less than zero. If delta G were less than zero for this reaction is written, then it is the forward reaction that's spontaneous. If delta G is, is less than zero, or is greater than zero, sorry, that for the reaction is written, then it's the reverse reaction that's spontaneous. And now, here comes the really important point. <clears throat> and that is, if delta G is equal to zero for that reaction as written, then, hey, then we're at chemical equilibrium. When delta G is equal to zero, then we're at equilibrium. Notice this is not delta G naught equals zero. This is delta G equals zero. That's what defines chemical equilibrium. When that delta G that I just showed you is equal to zero. Okay. So here's that expression again that I showed you. Delta G is delta G naught plus RTLN of this reaction quotient. What I'm saying is that we're at equilibrium when this delta G here, this one, is equal to zero. Not that one, this one. Okay? All right. If that's the case, if you're at equilibrium, then I can take this reaction, or I can take this equation here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to move delta G naught to this side, and the result is delta G naught is equal to minus RTLN of this reaction quotient. All right, see where I'm going? Delta G was equal to zero. That let me then solve for delta G naught is equal to minus RTLN of this reaction quotient. Okay. Now. Under this condition, when delta G is equal to zero, this reaction quotient Q has a special name. And that special name is a thermodynamic equilibrium constant. Right? When we're at equilibrium, this reaction quotient is that equilibrium constant, K. This defines the equilibrium constant. What the equilibrium constant tells us is about the relative proportions here of the products to the reactants. So if the equilibrium constant is large, hey, we got a lot of products. The numerator's got to be large relative to the reactants. If the equilibrium constant is small, well, then we've got few products relative to the reactants, okay? So the quotient, Q, that reaction quotient, is equal to the equilibrium constant when delta G is equal to zero, okay? Not delta G naught. All right, and so that's where this expression comes from. Delta G naught is equal to minus RT times the log of the equilibrium constant, okay? <clears throat>
So if you know delta G naught for a reaction, hey, you can figure out the equilibrium constant. If you know the equilibrium constant by knowing, say, the partial pressures present of the products and the reactants at equilibrium, you can work backwards and get delta G naught. OK? OK. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to rearrange these equations here a little bit. We're going to rearrange them in a form so that it will be easy to tell whether or not you're at chemical equilibrium. We're going to use this reaction quotient Q as a measure of whether or not we are at chemical equilibrium. We're going to compare Q to K, right? When Q is equal to K, we're at equilibrium. Remember what Q is. Q is the, in the ratio of the instantaneous partial pressures of the products to the reactants at any time during the reaction. K is the ratio of the equilibrium partial pressures of the products to the reactants. All right, so now we're going to work on a formalism that's going to allow us to easily compare Q to K so that we can tell whether or not we're at chemical equilibrium. All right, let's do that. So here's the expression that I wrote earlier that allowed me to calculate delta G at any arbitrary pressures for the products and the reactants. Here is the expression that I got when delta G was 0, when we're at equilibrium, right? And then delta G is equal to minus RTL N of K. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to take this and I'm going to substitute it in. Let's do that, right? I'm going to substitute this into this more general form. When I do that, I'm going to get minus RTL N of K plus RTLN of Q, right? This is just a simple substitution. But now, what do I got? I have the difference between two logs. I have a minus LNK here plus an LNQ here. The difference between logs is the log of that quotient of the arguments of those logs. So I have RT, is equal, uh, RT times LN of Q over K. All right, this is the difference in the logs. That's then the uh, log of the quotient of the arguments of those logs. OK, so this is going to be great here, because look at what we're going to be able to do. Remember what Q is the ratio of instantaneous partial pressures, right? And you know what K is, the ratio of partial pressures at equilibrium. So bottom line here is the following. If Q, right, is less than K, if Q is less than K, what that means is we don't have enough products formed compared to what we should have at equilibrium. That's when Q is less than K. We, don't, we haven't got enough products compared to what we need for chemical equilibrium. If Q is less than K, well then up here in this expression for delta G, we have the log of a number smaller than 1. The log of a number smaller than 1 is going to be negative. So if Q is less than K, then our delta G is going to be negative. If our delta G, and notice this is delta G, not delta G naught. If our delta G is negative, then the reaction is going to be spontaneous in that forward direction. On the other hand, if we've got a situation where Q is greater than K. That is, where we have more products than what equilibrium says we should have. Well, then in that case, Q over K is going to be a number greater than 1. 
and the log of a number greater than 1 is always going to be positive. And so our delta G here, our delta G for the reaction as written, that delta G is going to be greater than 0. And so the forward reaction is not spontaneous, but the reverse reaction is spontaneous. And what's going to happen is that the chemical reaction will proceed in the reverse direction. It will use up all of those extra products that we made for whatever or had for whatever reason to try to attain equilibrium. Here's another way to look at it. I'm going to plot here Q versus the time of a reaction. And we know when Q is equal to K, we're at chemical equilibrium. So suppose we start in a condition, some time t equals 0, where Q is less than K. All right? If Q is less than K, what that says is that we don't have enough products compared to what we need for chemical equilibrium. So when Q is less than K, the reaction is going to proceed in the forward direction. It is going to make the products so that we can attain equilibrium, so we can make enough products so that we get Q is equal to K. The reaction will proceed in the forward direction. If, however, we start in a situation where Q is greater than K. If Q is greater than K, it means we've got too many products compared to what our chemical equilibrium says we should have. And so what's going to happen is that the reverse reaction is going to proceed. It's going to use up those products and form more reactants so that it can attain the equilibrium value for the partial pressures of the products and the reactants. OK? So Q is going to be our measure of whether or not a reaction is at chemical equilibrium. Very important. All right? Questions? R is the gas constant. It is something that will be given to you. You can look up. Other questions? Okay, see you later this week. <laughs>